Hi again, everyone. I'm Mathieu Lefebvre. Just before our, our first panel uh, gets ready, just a few points of, uh, of housekeeping uh, so that the, the rules of this particular city we've created are, are clear to, to everyone. Um, after this session and, and every day for the networking and coffee breaks in the morning and in the afternoon, I invite you to exit the stage through the bottom. So the coffee breaks will be served in the bottom and in the lower part, and lunch breaks will be uh, on the top. The second point is about Wi-Fi. If you open your various devices, you will find a Wi-Fi network called NCS Summit, which is uh, open to use. All you need to do is uh, enter your name uh, and your email, and then you will be uh, able to use, use Wi-Fi. I also uh, want to attract your attention to a wonderful tool we've put in place called Presdo Match which is, uh, you'll find on our website, newcitysummit2012.org, and there's a networking box on the top, which allows you to see who's here, see who will be here over the next three days, and also to message them if you want to set up meetings, which is, as John was saying, a very important part of what, what we want to achieve here. Final point is about Twitter um, and Facebook. We invite those of you who, who tweet to, uh, to do so, and there are instructions on, on how to do that in your catalogs with the uh, handles and hashtags you might use. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Have a wonderful, wonderful few days, and over to our first panel. Thank you. Well, we could look around uh, outside at La Défense, and we could wonder why, uh, why do we live in cities? Or then we could walk a little further to a Paris of cafes and theatres and bookshops, galleries, and wonder why that would ever be a question. Who wouldn't want to live in a city? Or we could look at the model of uh, La Défense upstairs and, uh, and see Doha or Dubai or Abu Dhabi and see a kind of globalization of the city. The city is becoming uh, something that is recognizable, extremely recognizable across the world. <coughs> I'm hoping we're going to talk a little about this today. I'm just going to give you one quick quote, and then I'm going to hand over. Lewis Mumford wrote that the final mission of the city is to further man's conscious participation in the cosmic and the historic process. Through its own complex and enduring structure, the city vastly augments man's ability to interpret these processes and take an active, formative part in them, so that every phase of the drama it stages shall have the illumination of consciousness, the stamp of purpose, and the color of love. So for this opening session, we'll be looking at how we became an urban species and why it matters. I'm not gonna go through the statistics. You've had those, you'll have more. But we will look at, at why it's happening so quickly and what we can do to ensure that those cities are good places, not just to survive, but to thrive. We're extremely lucky to have this distinguished panel to uh, open the event. And to start us off, we have Professor Jeffrey West, who is a uh, British-born US resident, British uh, a theoretical physicist, former president and uh, a distinguished professor of the Santa Fe Institute. And he's one of the leading scientists working on a, on a model of cities using extraordinary biological analogies, which I can't even begin to explain, so I'll and right over to Professor West. Thank you. Um, I have to get the... Uh, <clears throat> yes. So thank you very much, and thank uh, the advisors for having me. I was asked to give a kind of provocative big overview of cities, where we've come from, some of the regularities of cities, and some of the organization and functionalities of cities. And um, I'm, I started off by repeating actually what you've already heard, that we live in this extraordinarily exponentially expanding socioeconomic universe of which urbanization is both the major challenge and in many ways the major driver. We've gone from a few percent to 80% in, in about 200 years. And perhaps the most extraordinary aspect of it is that, um, roughly speaking, every week from now to 2050, more than a million people, maybe even close to two million people a week, are being urbanized on the planet, mostly in the developing world. But nevertheless, this means that by next month, there's the equivalent of another Paris on this planet. So this is an extraordinary challenge. And they do it because people are attracted to the extraordinary buzz, 
the jobs, the kind of culture, the goods that are available in terms of what cities have to offer, but driven by an open-ended financial market. That's the idea, but there's a heavy price to play, which I call socioeconomic entropy, and it's this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and the question is, is that what cities are gonna look like by 2050? Or like that even? Or hopefully they look more like this and this and even like this still, this, this, and possibly eventually like this and this. So this is the kind of thing we're gonna be talking about. And the big question really, that's challenging us is, is all of this actually sustainable and how do we come to terms with it? And I want to talk a little bit about the possibility of a science of cities, meaning are there quantitative predictive rules that can help us uh, guide us in some way in, in getting through to this uh, huge challenge that we have that complements kind of more traditional views. So the first question I wanna ask is this, just another version of this, because if it is, we start to be in good shape because you ask any question that can be put in a quantitative form, anything that can be measured about that forest, how many trees of given size, how many leaves on each branch, how big is the canopy, what is the mortality rate, what is the growth rate, there is a mathematical formula based on underlying conceptual framework and principles, you can answer it. And the question is, can you do the same for this? That would be wonderful if that were the case. And Part of the question that comes up is the question of scalability, because scalability, the fact that you can have the same phenomenon at different scales, is intimately related to questions of the resilience, the growth and evolvability, both of organisms, but also of cities. So for example, this is us. Each one of us is one of these, and we scale over 100 million times in our size, um, and here it is graphically shown, and I want to just spend a minute on this. What is plotted here is the most fundamental quality about your life. How much food you need to eat per day to stay alive, that's called metabolic rate, and on the vertical axis, it goes up by factors of 10, and on the horizontal axis is the weight going up by factors of 10, and what you see is something extraordinary. There is a very simple rule. There's a tremendous simplicity despite the fact that this is the most diverse and complex system in the universe. Here it is, and one of the amazing things about it is that the slope of that is less than one, meaning that there is an economy of scale, meaning that the bigger you are, the less energy you need per cell, per capita, to stay alive. Life scales across any physiological variable you want to think of, or any life history event, like lifespan, growth rates, diffusion rates, and so on. And expressed in it are these incredible economies of scale. And the reason for it is that we are sustained by underlying networks at all scales. And you're familiar with these. And those networks play a crucial role in your growth. That's how you grew when you were, if you were a rat, but you behaved in the same way, you grow you start growing quickly and stop. And the theory is that line and the points are data and that theory is the same theory based on networks to do with um, uh, that I showed you for uh, metabolic rate and all the other physiological variables. Now, uh, that kind of growth is completely different than socioeconomic growth, which we have this idea of open-ended growth. So what's going on here? So here's the summary of biology. What I've just said, we have these scaling laws, we have this extraordinary economy of scale. The other thing that goes along with that is the pace of life systematically decreases with size. And all of that is due to networks. And the question is, to what extent are cities like that? Because cities are indeed networks. We're very familiar with them. But the most important network is what we're doing now and it was already said a moment ago, the, it, the quote from Lewis Mumford, the interaction between people and the clustering of people, this is what cities are for, is to facilitate that, 
to instantiate it, and from that, create, make innovation, ideas, and wealth. So, let's ask about the scaling of cities. Are they like biology? Well, this happens to be a very trivial one. This is the number of gas stations, petrol stations, in cities across Europe as a function of their size, plotted in the same way as biology. And you see an extraordinary simple scaling law, meaning you tell me the size of a city in France, and I will tell you, roughly speaking, to within 10% how many gas stations it will have. This kind of law is true across the planet. It's the same law. The slope of that is 0.85, which means you double the size of a city. You don't double the number of gas stations. You only need 85% more, no matter where you are in the world. But that's true of every infrastructural quantity, like length of roads, length of electrical cables, et cetera, et cetera. But more impressively, if you look at socioeconomic quantities, quantities that involve the interaction between human beings, we see also a, a systematic scaling. And what's shown here is wages and super creative people, like all of you, and plotted versus size. And what you see is systematic kind of behavior, meaning in this, the slope of this is not less than one, as it was in biology or gas stations. It's bigger than one, meaning the bigger the city, systematically higher wages, more super creative people, more patents are produced, greater innovation, more crime is done. And there's a kind of universality, namely any socioeconomic quantity. And here's plotted GDP, crime, income, and patents. They all fall on the same line. So there's a general rule. Uh, there's also diversity, which I will not have time to discuss. There's a very general rule that if you double the size of a city from 50,000 to 100,000, from 5 million to 10 million, 10 million to 20 million, doesn't matter, systematically, anywhere in the world, you find that you have an increase in income, wealth, number of patents, number of colleges, number of patents, number amount of crime, amount of pollution, et cetera, all by about 15%. And at the same time, you save approximately 15% on all the infrastructure, anywhere in the world, saying that despite all of the politicians and all of the urban planners and all of the history, culture, and geography, there is a dynamic inherent in cities that up to about 85% of its measurable quantities, its measurable properties, are somehow determined by its organic growth, determined, we believe, by the universality of human interaction, the stuff that was quoted by Lewis Mumford, the way humans interact. So all of these phenomena, this tsunami of problems that we are facing are not independent. They're all interconnected because they're all interconnected through us and through the universality of social networks. OK, finally, unlike biology, where the pace of life systematically slows, on the left there is heart rate. On the right is the speed of walking in European cities, systematically increasing. And there it is, speed, of, speed versus population. And that line is a prediction from this theoretical framework. And this is kind of the, uh, th this, is, this is the summary of the way cities work. They have this extraordinary systematic behavior. The pace of life systematically increases. And unlike biology, which has symbolically this what we call sigmoidal growth, growth stops. And the system is highly sustainable in Cities and in socioeconomic systems, we have open-ended growth, but with the possibility of collapse. And the only way to keep growing is to have continuous innovation, cycles of innovation, to allow for open-ended growth. And I will finish with one amazing slide, just to give you again a picture of what cities are doing to us. You sitting there, the amount of food you use corresponds to about that 2,000 food calories is about a light bulb, is 90 watts. That's all you need, all of you sitting there, 90 watts to stay alive. That's how you evolved biologically until about 10,000 years ago when we urbanized, instead of 10, 100 watts, 90 watts, each one of us in this room needs 11,000 watts to have everything we have around us. 
the cars and the lights and so on. And that corresponds to a 30,000 kilogram gorilla. Each one of us in this room is basically a dozen elephants. And there are seven billion people on this planet wanting to be that way and to be urbanized in that way, to have this going to 10 billion. This is the challenge. And I will finish there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor West. Next, uh, if we could welcome uh, Gregor Robertson, who's a Canadian politician who's been mayor of Vancouver since 2008, and this is now his second term. And Vancouver, uh, I'm sure you'll know that despite all the, all the problems of a, a big city, is nevertheless often voted one of the world's best places to live. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, bonjour à tous. Uh, je suis honoré d'être ici. I'm Gregor Robertson. It's uh, wonderful to join you here. Uh, although Canada is bilingual, and French being uh, one of our two languages, along with the one I'm speaking in English, uh, in Vancouver, about uh, half of the city uh, originates from Asia. So the most, second most spoken language is uh, Mandarin in Vancouver. So we'll say, Gateway Pengyo, Gateway Lai Bin, Da Jia Hao. Good day to you all. I want to thank uh, our, uh, our uh, organizers for putting this together, John and the team at, at New Cities. Great job getting this kicked off. A really, really important conversations to be had here. And uh, thanks to our hosts here in, uh, in La Defense, uh, the mayor of Paris, Mayor Delanoy, uh, for hosting us. It was a gorgeous day yesterday. Uh, how many people here got to enjoy Paris yesterday in the sunshine? Well, we were blessed, those of us who were here. Days like uh, yesterday are days where I think everybody celebrates the city and celebrates the mayor and what a great job he or she is doing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you can be a hero on one day and you can be a complete scoundrel on the next day when anything goes wrong in the systems of a city. Running a city is a very tough business. Uh, it is uh, full of relentless challenges, whether they're political or bureaucratic, uh, whether they're economic. It requires, I think, a very, an entrepreneurial approach uh, to really survive this and uh, to deal with all of the challenges of a, of a city, maintaining the infrastructure, uh, maintaining a strong economy, uh, making sure that uh, you have uh, affordability, you can keep new technology being introduced in your city, uh, but it goes beyond that. I think people in cities now, the, the so-called new urbanites that we uh, have been tasked with talking about, are very demanding. They, they demand that there are those solid services delivered every single day, that uh, the garbage is picked up, that uh, we plow the snow where it's cold, uh, we keep our city safe, we deliver good emergency services. That's a requirement of a city, and when that falls apart, uh, the mayor doesn't last very long, and uh, a city does not thrive. But I think in this day and age, people want more than that. They want to have moments of inspiration, of making history, of making a significant contribution to the future. So uh, in our cities, I think in these times, we have to go above and beyond and, and create that higher level of performance and, and striving to be, do better. Vancouver, uh, as you'll see lots of uh, glamorous shots of here, is a, is a beautiful place, a city with great strengths, as I said, people, about half came from Europe, half from Asia, many new immigrants every day showing up in Vancouver. Uh, we are blessed with a gorgeous setting and uh, blessed with a multiculturalism that is, is maybe our greatest strength now that has emerged uh, recently. We have a, a big goal to be, become the greenest city in the world by 2020, and there's a big vision piece that I put forward campaigning as mayor to strive uh, to make our city uh, sustainable as challenging as that can be. There are tougher challenges though in the day to day. Affordability is a huge issue in Vancouver, one of the most expensive cities to live in now. Uh, unfortunately, uh, daily uh, incomes for people who live in Vancouver have not kept up with, uh, with affordability. We have uh, grown very rapidly. It's, it's uh, always a challenge to uh, limit our rainfall to only a few months in the winter. We have uh, intense poverty and homelessness, believe it or not, some right in the core of our city, uh, drug addiction related, being a big port on the Pacific, uh, mental illness, the, the challenges of concentrating people and the disparity of incomes. So we have that big challenge. That has been another real uh, task for me to take on as a mayor. But I come into uh, being a mayor from a background in the private sector. I'm an entrepreneur and decided to apply my my entrepreneurial skills to politics and to, to deliver something uh, different 
have something better in terms of politics for my community. I, I learned right away that uh, it's very different being in politics than in business. You have to have a thicker skin. You, uh, there's no doubt you are the scapegoat for just about anything that can go wrong in a city. My first month as mayor was uh, December 2008, which was when the financial, uh, uh, the financial regime around the world was in a bit of a free fall. We have, we're building the Athletes' Village in Vancouver, and uh, that fell into a financial meltdown. We had the biggest snowstorms in 50 years that lasted for a month, and we didn't have enough snow plows to deal with that. So I learned right away uh, the challenges of managing uh, significant problems in our city, but really confirmed three main beliefs. Uh, as I've been in, uh, a mayor over these last several years, uh, being entrepreneurial is actually crucial to get things done in a city. And being entrepreneurial means creating really strong partnerships. Both the public and private sector, but also community organizations are essential to have those, uh, that collaboration. Uh, also, that, um, that we cannot compromise uh, for our future generations, for really making sure that we are protecting and restoring the living city systems in a city, whether they're local, with, our, uh, with dealing with our waste on a local basis, to climate change and the impact that that's now having and accumulating into our cities. So our, our most successful partnership would be, um, an example of that would be the 2010 Winter Olympics. It was a, a huge undertaking for our city. It was an, a, an amazing partnership between public and private and community. We all had a common goal. We had this, uh, we had this need to win. The, the competitive and cooperative uh, combination with the Olympics I, kept everyone very focused in the city on uh, delivering, making sure that we uh, were shining when we were on the world stage. And uh, it was a great opportunity for us. Uh, I would say with that, we, we've had an opportunity to do a lot of different projects through our city that uh, are all about collaboration. That, uh, and our goal is always to, as we say in, in, uh, in Scrabble, a triple word score or a win-win-win. Projects that uh, make the community stronger, that contribute jobs into our economy, and uh, that are good for our city, are greening our city. So we're looking to get all of those with each of these opportunities. Uh, our goal, really, uh, in these partnerships, we've, we've had, uh, just to name a few, we've actually worked with Cisco, uh, Vim will speak in a moment, uh, and a local company called Pulse Energy on energy management for all of our city buildings, making them more efficient and monitoring that. We've had, uh, we've built, building 1,500 units of supportive housing for people with uh, addictions and mental illnesses in LEED Gold buildings, an extraordinary partnership with other levels of government and community organizations. Uh, we have uh, car sharing, uh, district energy systems, composting systems with a company called Harvest Power, uh, rapid transit system from the airport to downtown that was built a few years ago for the Olympics. Uh, private public private partnership, an open data initiative that opens all the data of the city to share with citizens so they can be entrepreneurial and, and create businesses from that data. Uh, the latest example that I want to uh, describe, a new idea that's emerging, I've been uh, working with a real innovator from Vancouver named Douglas Copeland who is joining us and is going to speak to this uh, later this morning. He is uh, an author, uh, a visual artist and a futurist who uh, hails from Vancouver, and he, we, he's been working on this concept that we, uh, uh, we're calling the V-Pole for Vancouver. And I think we were calling earlier versions of it the Smart Pole, but this is um, infrastructure that integrates many functions in one. It starts uh, at the top with LED streetlights. It then combines uh, all of the tech newest technologies for Wi-Fi and cellular uh, broadcast uh, in, into a a sleek pole, it uh, at the ground level can provide us with electric vehicle charging for zero emission vehicles, for parking, smart parking uh, that you can operate using your smartphone, and, and also potentially community uh, bulletin boards that are digital bullet, bulletin boards at a community level. And here's a, here's a concept that is, uh, I think, just being uh, created uh, through Doug's vision and through the implementation that we think is possible with private partners in the city. This is a remake of our infrastructure that integrates technologies, that provides much better service for citizens, particularly when we see uh, data use over the next three years will increase by about 30 times. We have to remake the communications and IT infrastructure of our city to, to ensure that we can uh, deal with this. We also have to transform our uh, transportation system so that it is zero emission, 
so that we can uh, embrace car sharing and, and more efficiently using the tools. Uh, so this is an example. There, there are a few pictures of it here uh, that uh, will give you a sense for what it really is. But basically, uh, it's a, a, an approach that we want to see implemented uh, in the months and years ahead throughout our city. We have 41,000 poles uh, around the city for lights uh, right now, primarily for lighting. Uh, but we want to see that uh, integrated with communications and transportation uh, where we can supply uh, all of these services to our citizens. So just a, uh, that's a kind of into the future example of the collaboration and partnership and the creativity that we think we need to deliver for citizens uh, in our city and around the world. And what, what is fantastic between many cities right now is that we're seeing kind of a race to the top and uh, ideas being shared. Uh, when we see ideas, a good idea happen. Uh, some of the ideas I saw in Paris yesterday as I uh, scooted around on their, on their Vélib uh, bicycle system, which I'd say has transformed the streets of Paris over the last several years and, and really made it a much more livable city, uh, particularly if you're on foot or on a bike. And uh, I think these are the kind of innovations that we're going to need to see in cities, and we're going to learn them from each other. Uh, and really, I think we'll see a great transformation in many cities uh, thanks to technology and thanks to the information sharing that we can do now uh, in our cities. So I'll leave it there and look forward to the dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Gregor. Uh, next, if I could introduce uh, Ajit Gulabchand, who's uh, an Indian industrialist, <clears throat> currently the chairman and managing director of the Hindustan Construction Company. And he's behind the uh, construction of an entire new hill city named Lavasa near Pune. Please. Well, when we are looking at cities, though some of the problems are the same throughout the world, we are really looking at <clears throat> a very different problem in the developing world. If you're talking about just improving the cities in the West or in the developed world, to make them just not only more livable, but to modernize them, to take on. But there's not that much influx of population coming into those cities from the region. Whereas in the developing world, you're going to have a massive migration. When you look at India alone, about 400 million people would be moving to cities in the next 30 to 40 years. That's a huge migration. It took Europe almost a thousand years for that kind of migration to happen. And therefore, the challenges before us are how are we going to build these cities, new neighborhoods to meet this. To go back to this, if we can go back to India host, is host to the largest, survive, oldest surviving city, Banaras, which has been around, and it's, it is a microcosm of, of India, and has always been so. It represents all the all the aspects and attitudes of India. And then we got a modern city like, uh, uh, like Mumbai, which was created in the last 200 years. And you brought in enormous dynamism to an ancient land that was modernizing rapidly, but had no tools to actually look at it. And Bombay provided those tools to do so. Of course, there have been several cities through history of India. I mean, we're talking about Ayodhya at the time of uh, Ramayana, and we're talking about Hastinapur and Pataliputra. These are very ancient cities. We're talking about not just 2,000, but about 4,000 years ago. But what we now have is a problem of cities in India. The challenge is in building these new cities. India does not have, at this present time, a very good model for governing and managing cities. Substantial power is in the hands of the central government and the state governments, and therefore the cities do not get the kind of attention that they require. Whatever governance processes are there at the city and town level are quite inadequate in order to deal with this ma massive migration, as you can see from the city of Bombay. Most of the citizens of Bombay, more than 60%, live in slums. Now, on one side, the slums are a horrible place to live in. But on the other side, they are the inspiration of the village folk that have come into the city and made room for themselves because the governance does not allow them 
to be able to build it fast enough to cope with the kind of migration. So this is something that we are now confronted with. Now, how are we then going to build 500 new cities that we require, the hundreds of new neighborhoods that we will require, besides improving our existing cities? I think this is something of a challenge. And therefore, here we felt that a public-private partnership would come be the only way that we can actually evolve. Because there is no time to evolve a village headman to a mayor of a city over the next thousand years. It has to be done very quickly. And therefore, the biggest challenge that one faces, the lack of this particular model creates a big challenge for private sector to step in and form this public-private partnership. Because then the onus is on that sector to provide the entire infrastructure, but then what about the infrastructure that links the new city you're building to the rest of the cities in the, in the state and in the country? How are we going to provide it with the power? As, as Professor West said, that each one of those watching television knows how the world lives and wants 11,000 watts of energy to survive. And if that is to be provided to this large populations of Asia and Africa, then we are going to have issues of sustainability. So on one side, we have to look at how are we going to create economies in these new places for people to want to migrate there. When it comes to neighborhoods of existing cities, those economies exist, people will migrate there. But what about the new places? So the first challenge is what kind of economy should different places create in order to attract migration to them rather than to the existing cities? The second is, who will build the infrastructure and how will you manage that infrastructure? And this will need a whole lot of new, new methods, new, new energy saving devices like Tuman Cisco is creating in order to do that. And last of all, when we talk of sustainability, it's not just environmental sustainability, but what about the economic sustainability? If these cities are going to cost as much as Paris to live in, or London to live in, then they're not going to happen in India. They will have to be affordable. So the economic sustainability of that city is another idea that has not given, been given enough thought in India. And then finally, you're going to get a migration that's not just coming from one section of society in India. It's going to come from all over. And therefore, social integration is going to be another big challenge. So a sustainability which is both environmental, economic, as well as social, is what, is what we are really looking at. And to bring this about by a public-private partnership is the biggest challenge. There's a huge migration from rural areas. And this has been so here too. And this is one challenge that we in Lavasa are facing. We are facing this challenge because we have to create the city in the hills, and when we have to create it, we have to create an economy there, which is primarily based on education, tourism, hospitality, leisure, and soft businesses, because it cannot have manufacturing there. And what, it's a kind of chicken and egg situation, what would come first? And therefore, it requires a public-private partnership where the governments of the state would want to make this happen. And these are early days, and we are still yet to grapple with this problem as an institutional problem. However, having seen the challenge, these are happening. People themselves are migrating and creating cities. We have seen Gurgaon near Delhi happen purely because the people wanted to make it happen, and they made it happen. So it is likely to be more organic as a growth in spite of the fact that you would put in a lot of public-private energy to make this happen. And so it's extremely important that we look at these cities, because this is where most of India, most of China is going to reside, most of Africa in the next 30 to 40 years. And as we have seen, it happened in Europe, and it's one of those important comments, the only time Karl Marx actually uh, commended the, the bourgeoisie was when he said they built civilizations and cities bigger and better than Rome and Athens, and relieved the rural, rural folk of their awkwardness and boredom. So there's a lot of rural folk in India and China that want to be relieved of their awkwardness and boredom. And that is the challenge India faces. 
And ours is one attempt to create this public-private partnership. Hopefully, by creating a sustainability index on this, that we will make it a, a replicable model. Thank you. Thank you, Ajit. Forgive me, I was in charge of the slides there, so I completely messed that up. <clears throat> Sorry. Finally, we have uh, Vim Elfrink, who is Executive Vice President, Emerging Solutions and Chief Globalization Officer of Cisco Systems. And uh, his particular interest is in what he calls the globalization of the corporate brain. And he spent the, uh, the last year backing up that, uh, that, that series of ideas uh, living in Bangalore. So if I could please welcome. Thank you, Mr. Elfring. Good morning. Namaste. Ni hao. That's 80% of the world population, isn't it? Welcome uh, this morning. How, how did we become urbanists um, 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago? And when, when, started, when did we start to live in villages? When did we go to cities? And the, the first reason was security. And we built big walls around our cities. And that when we started in Iraq, in uh, Jordan, uh, in Egypt, and these are these huge cities with walls around them. And we still look for security, but we don't do a security with walls anymore. Uh, we looked for prosperity, and basically for work. And last but not least, um, we wanted to have some quality of life. And it was good to be back in Paris yesterday and, and to enjoy a good lunch at, on the terrace outside at the theaters, culture, and that, that if cities start to prosper, then we go up in the Maslow and we get higher and higher needs. So it took us two, 3,000 years to build the cities we have, and most cities were on the sea to be able to trade. And because we started to trade when Columbus discovered the US and Vasco da Gama, the way to the east, but now we have to build 100 cities of a million people and more, you know, in a couple of decades. How are we going to do that? You can't think traditionally. And you have to think out of the box. You have to think in different models, in replicable models. And so there are a couple of drivers that I should like to leave you with uh, for this morning and the next coming days uh, to discuss, to collaborate. And, and the first one I want to give you uh, is globalization. Like I said, we traded uh, for hundreds of years and that made the cities more prosperous. Uh, then we started to outsource manufacturing to the east. We started to outsource R&D. But now we also start to outsource the corporate brains. Uh, because if you hear this initiative of the new cities and whether it's Kolkovo in Russia, who wants to become a Silicon Valley? Whether it's in Qatar, where we're going to build an aeronautical city, or whether we go to others, all cities have a theme. And they don't just start from scratch, and they start with a vision. People are more mobile. So young people have a choice. And in Australia at the moment, between Melbourne and Sydney, there is already a competition going on how to attract young people. And so we have a very unbalanced world. On one hand, we are aging at the US, China. In Europe, we're aging and shrinking. And that in 30 years, 30%, you know, I have a Dutch accent, I'm, I'm Dutch. Um, and it's, in, 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 in two decades, 30% of the population will be 65 years and older. I will be one of them, by the way. Uh, but the point I tried to make is that people are mobile and they will move around and they will shift. So we not just talk about creating new cities, 100 cities, a million people and more, and we also have to revitalize our cities that we have. I'm born in Rotterdam, and that when I was a kid and my father took me to the harbor, he always said, Wim, that this harbor is going to change. It will be not in the city, it will be somewhere in the sea, and big ships will anchor and load and unload. When I take my kids now to Rotterdam and said, look, if you think and you have my age, probably there will not be a harbor in the Netherlands anymore. And if the King Abdullah Economic City or Jeddah get their ports, ships will dock there. And there will be a railroad to Germany. And so, so everything is changing at a speed that is unprecedented. 
We've, and we took 2,000 years to build what we have, and now we have to start building in a couple of decades what we need. How are we going to find employment for, you know, three, four billion people? Can we do that in the way we have done that before? We have to step and think out of the box. So if you think about the future of work, and the future of work is going to be virtualized. And what I mean by that, I'll give you some, some examples. But anyway, I see already a lot of you working here, probably with your head office, from your lab, on your laptop. And we're always connected. We're mobile, and we move around. So if I give my anchor type of project, which is the city of Incheon in Korea, it's another new phenomenon that we didn't know 100 years ago, an aerotropolis, a city around an airport. And cities around an airport are economic centers that vibrate, create new jobs, and do a lot of good things. Um, and whether it is for entertainment, uh, tourism, or whether it is for supply. A city like Minnesota, that, that, that where uh, that UPS has a, a big, it creates jobs. Uh, Erythropolis is a new phenomenon uh, that, that we haven't really studied yet. We, we just you know, assume it's there and it will play a role. Uh, but so this city is built from reclaimed land um, and it, it, it's purely developed green. And so it was a waste management system underground, and, and everything is reasonable from a distance point of view. It's 12 minutes walk. In the, in the heart of the center, there is a park. And so architects did a great, fantastic job in anticipating how a new city could look, and then also make it a city in the box that would only need development of 10 years, not 20 or 30. That's not the way and the speed to build 100 cities and more. But on top of that, we, we made it an, a network city. And all utilities are connected, and you will have one big data center. And a lot of people think that that is the target. I would say that's the minimum. It will be the new norm. And because it's the only way to be competitive and to get your costs under control and to have sustainable energy management. It's not the target, it's the minimum. And so the future of competition is going to be between cities. Also as an existing city, how do you prepare for that? What you will see in these cities that on one hand, uh, you will have what we call an integrated operations center. Uh, all data comes together and you can basically uh, guide the city. Uh, in Rio, we are experimenting that. Vancouver is doing work. A lot of cities around the world are picking this up. And you can do scenario planning. Everything will be real time. Everything is connected. And so transport, disaster planning. I was in Rio and there was a thermostat th 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 coming in. We had to close down a couple of airports, uh, migrate children to school from home. How can you do that in an integrated way and fast? Machine to machine. And we already talked about what we call old IT and new IT. And that IT is not just processing transactions anymore. It will be machine-to-machine -machine industrialization of the internet. But what a lot of cities don't realize yet, if you have all that data, data is going to be new gold. How can you monetize that? And then we, we, we have the, all these applications that we start using on laptops, on phones. And so if you have that data in cities, uh, you have a new source of income. And you, you, you can, we don't think that way yet. And that's, I always say that, that you know, I, I was 12 years old when I got a television at home, you know, that black and white type of thing. I didn't envision that I would stand here now. And that's, um, you know, 20 years the first time I flew in my life. And I talk about an erythropolis. Um, and that when my son was 10, he said, Dad, I want to have a cell phone. And I told him, I said, I think you're a little bit too young. And then he looked at me and he had the deadly question, how old were you? And he lost the debate because I was 35. The point I try to make uh, is that we think far too, uh, because we start debating, will this happen, will this not happen? Embrace it. Embrace it. Make it part of your city plan. Appoint a CIO. Uh, think, what is the new norm? Where should I be? Uh, because citizens will consume all that data from home um, or you know, from the cell phone, from the laptop, or whatever device that own, I, I don't envision yet. Because I didn't envision when, that I was a kid 
that I would stand here and, and have these type of presentations with you. And technology changes life faster than we think. And we need, we need transformational thinking and to build 100 cities of a million people and more. So these services, because we don't talk about technology anymore, citizens, city dwellers will consume technology as a service. They don't buy technology. It will be the fourth utility, like water and electricity. And you will get data in your house, and you buy a service um, and to connect with the school, and to uh, renew your driving license, to find a parking place. If we still have cars in these cities, did you know that the average person, citizens in Paris spend four years of their life to find a parking place? Why, why should you want to have a car? You know? Take public transport and use the time efficiently. So the benefits, we still talk about benefits, but I would say this is the new norm. You have to plan for it. You can't wait, because then your city is not competitive. And so it's not just that we talk about energy saving, water consumption, crime rates. In, 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 where people feel good, there is less crime. And you can't build walls anymore like we did on Jericho. And the traffic will go down, because a lot of things will be virtualized. But also, we have to start thinking in these new cities, and whether it's Mumbai, whether it's in China, and the cities don't make people poor. Poor people come to cities. So how can you provide education and healthcare? And that, that, like Mumbai, what, what, what Ajit is, is an example gave. Yeah, but there are slums in Rio de Janeiro. So if you have the technology and you use it wisely to create a new norm, you can also use the technology uh, to provide virtual education and virtual healthcare for prices that are affordable. Uh, because we have to provide these new citizens with the right to education and to healthcare. That's the absolute minimum in life. Uh, so don't get me wrong if I talk about technology and infrastructure. Uh, it's not just for the rich, it's for inclusive growth. Three billion people are going to be connected to the internet. If you talk about the future of work, did you know that today already in rural India, we have people who are illiterate doing video surveillance work of stores in Europe and the US. You can virtualize the type and you can start rebalancing because with the demographic shifts, we will have this enormous inequity. And so if you think about the future of work, and you embrace virtualization in education, and there is mobility, there's spontaneous collaborations, and there will be clusters of experts. Think about what social networking will do. And we, we now say that you know, innovation comes in cities uh, because there are nice places to go for dinner, uh, to sit together, and uh, that Montmartre is famous for its literature, and uh, that the, these cafes, New Orleans for music, Silicon Valley and for innovation, but it's not just physical anymore. And you can now also virtualize. And it's via the, the physical type of environment you have, and you will have a you know, hundred types of contacts. But then via social networking, you can create clusters because you need clusters for innovation. And you need the academic world, you need venture capitalists, you need nice weather, you need nice restaurants. It has all come together. And if it doesn't come physically together, then you can create it virtually together. And I think that is one of the unique things in India, Ajit, that everything that, that takes physical work takes forever. Everything that goes virtually happens. So that's why a lot of software will be developed there and virtualization. So the future of work, nobody knows precisely how it will look. So in conclusion, just for collaboration and the next coming two, three days, and that embrace technology as just an enabler, not a goal. And to be competitive in your city, but also to create that gold mine of data that you can monetize. And where will we get and find $2 trillion a year for all these investments? So cities have to constantly reinvent themselves. Like I said in Rotterdam, what's the future? If you think you're safe, something will change. You constantly have to never think that you're done. Uh, secondly, embrace ICT as an asset, as a sustainable differentiator, as a key enabler for planning. And then create an ecosystem. Ajit talked about public-private partnerships. 
get an anchor type of vendor in your city and to drive innovation and, and to work around that. And there are a lot of great companies in technology that you can embrace and to help you, to guide you, and to collaborate you and to, to find smart regulation. Another thing, and as we have all these places and that uh, the science exit, you can digitize that. And that you have to have water tanks whilst you have a water neutral type of system. And so how can you lead your city with smart regulation and by that attract investors? Public-private partnerships. Government can't do it alone. Public sector can't do it alone. Private sector, we have to do it together. And then last but not least, a vision. And more and more cities have a vision. A five-year plan, a 10-year plan, and edit, being a mayor, I think, is one of the most complicated. Edit, if you have to be re-elected in four or five years, and you have to think 10 or 20 years out, that's not good. So great leadership, and determining what the city is, what it will be, and how it will be sustainable. Looking forward for a very interesting dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. That's good Yours. Well, thank you very much to the, uh, the panel. I'd like to thank them for being so bang on time as well. That's very unusual. I like, uh, I like the idea of seeing cities as full of elephants. I like, uh, I like the, uh, the mayors dealing in garbage, snow, and inspiration. I like light poles as well, and I'm looking forward to seeing some more of those. But it was interesting to see the little coincidence between Mayor uh, Robertson and, uh, and Professor West's idea of a city as a living system. Uh, looking at the Indian presentation, I half expected to see a city actually full of elephants, but it didn't come up. Maybe I was messing up the slides. And I also like the idea of the Jeddah to uh, Rotterdam Express. And I like the idea of, uh, of virtual work, which I'm, 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 I, would, I would like to engage in for the rest of my virtual. career. <laughs> and uh, in fact, it's one of the things that there, 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 there are also issues, I think, that, that, that were brought up with this. There's, there's the issue of private cities, which is controversial. There's the issue, uh, Vim just mentioned, of surveillance from the developing world of the Western cities. I mean, that, that, it's, it's an interesting concept, but it's problematic as well. There's the aerotropolis. I mean, anyone who spends time in, in airports might be nervous about the uh, about a future of aerotropoli. So I'd like, I think, to ask a few, or, or to kick it off with a, with a question about, about technology, as that's, that was the last subject we encountered, that the conventional wisdom is that technology will radically change cities. And in fact, I just heard the other day that the most influential technology in the developing world has been text messaging. Um, the actual world is, is, a, is, is often a long way behind the world that we discuss at these, at these conferences. And, and what I'd like to begin the conversation with is what how much of a part does technology actually play in changing cities? Well, Maybe I'll start I mean, with the mayor, as you have the most direct, well, real experience. Yeah. It's certainly become a real enabler in, in connecting people in our cities. I, I would say, uh, in, you know, obviously, information, uh, sense of what's happening move, moves very quickly. Uh, we're, we're all in real time. It doesn't take uh, the town crier and days or weeks for, uh, for news to travel around the community. Um, that said, there is still, I, I think we're, we're, it's a dual life right now. There's still real experience, the importance of FaceTime and uh, what happens in a city on a daily basis. Uh, most of it is, is live. I mean, cities, uh, cities are a success precisely because they cluster people and, right. they, and they have this space to face. And the importance in a city like Paris, you see the, the, the use of public space here, yeah. extraordinary public space that's been developed. Uh, there was a vision for that for generations and yeah. generations. And now, you know, on a beautiful spring day, and you, the way you see people gathered and mixing and mingling, all the cultures, it's, uh, that's what makes cities extraordinary. But technology, I think, enhances it, can take it to the next level. But it doesn't, you don't think, uh, Vim, that, that technology can, can detract from what makes cities great. That in fact, by taking away that need for personal contact, then it can alienate. If, if I may be a little bit provocative, that, you know, to be honest, I think we are the problem. Uh -huh. and because if you see, uh, the, the, you know, we talk about it, and that's sometimes perhaps even a little bit too intellectually. And it's, if we would think like my son of 13, you know, he thinks totally different. Yeah. And that he thinks in physical things, and he goes out with his friends. 
Yeah, but he also texts and he's connected. And, and so I think you have to, to, to be more open for it. And you have to anticipate. I think there is a much bigger role for, 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 for children of 13, 15 years uh, to predict the future of how we go into work together mm -hmm. and how to use it together. And, and I think that's why I'm so, so passionate uh, about countries who are getting younger, like India. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that whole, a lot of things in technology are generational. Uh, that I dare to say publicly uh, that it took uh, my wife 20 years to go from an analog washing machine to a digital because she didn't like it. <coughs> Yeah, but, but young people grow up different, and, and they embrace it, they use it. And so I think perhaps in city councils you should get them in and, and help them dream a little bit what could be possible. I just read a very interesting essay uh, which posited the provocative idea that the washing machine was a far more um, influential technology than the internet. And that actually, uh, because it, it, freed, it freed women from domestic chores in a way, and, and, it, and it, it brought an end to uh, a kind of culture of, uh, of a service culture, a servant culture. Uh, maybe when you're in a technology, it's hard to see what the most, when you're in the middle of it developing, it's hard to see what the most influential thing will be from your own era. Are there other things that you can see um, emerging from our era that might be as influential as, as connectedness or whatever it might be? You know, as a technologist and yeah, Anji, yeah, perhaps yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah. We work very closely, also, yeah, yes. uh, of course, with Lavasa. I know, but uh, it, it, it's it's machine to machine. Yeah. And it, I think really, and it, at this moment, we automate processes. Mm -hmm. And but I think in the next 20, 20, 10, 20 years, everything will be connected. And we need global open standards and protocols. And but it's like the internet 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Nobody 30 years ago would have predicted that we would sit here and be seamlessly connected with your laptop with your iPad, with your phone. And so a lot of things will start happening without intervention. And but Douglas and Copeland actually yeah, might have. Yeah. Sorry? Douglas Copeland in the audience, they might have predicted that. <laughs> and you know, when you talk of this, even, even where basic governance systems don't exist, yeah. while building Lavasa with the kind of technological uh, mapping of GIS, looking at governance of the cities, even today, in its very early stages, has been able to make it possible in such a short time. If you want to build something new, it doesn't take more than two days to decide how to go about it. Mm -hmm. So there are some advantages that you have in terms of maintenance of cities, of, yeah. of providing those services. And I think that if you can see, for example, India was not connected in many ways, mm -hmm. but the telecom, the, the GSM, yeah. the wireless telecom, Wi-Fi, has today, 900 million handsets in India. Right. So, so, you know, when you talk of a technology, it's not just of, of uh, just generational change. It's a, it's a quantum jump. Yeah. It suddenly connected so many people. So many farmers got access to information. Mm -hmm. So I think it has, it has a huge impact. Now, uh, who is to say whether it is, this is more, more of an impact than the... The washing, wife was the washing machine? Yeah. It was a, the, the images of, of Lavasa were quite, I mean, forgive me, I'm not, I'm not familiar with it, but the, they were, it was quite a traditional looking city. But it, I, I guess it was a del deliberately traditional looking city. The images of Lavasa we had there, were, it, was yeah. almost, it almost could have been an Italian well, hill town. No, no, it's not, it's not an Italian town because we were looking for waterfront apartments. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Only the European Riviera has has a model for waterfront mm -hmm. apartments. The rest of the places have villas or very high-rise buildings. So it was an inspiration. Okay. And there would be more such in, uh, buildings that would be built. And don't forget one more thing. Uh, India, the average age of India today is 26 years and seven months. We are discussing things that these people will appreciate right. and will want to live in. Mm -hmm. When we began, we were told that you will never be able to sell apartments in a hill city and round the lake, absolutely not. You will be surprised that whenever we bring out apartments for sale, it doesn't take longer than one week to sell. Mm -hmm. And we have sold 2,000 such apartments in the last two years. Right. So I think we need to understand that the cities will have to be more to the taste of the younger people that are going to now come up from Asia. Um, they have a very different view of doing things. Okay. And uh, may hopefully we have got it right. right. Maybe we need to tweak it further. 
At some later stage, they may want a lot more Indian motives. But you know, Indian motives don't make it Indian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And neither the it Italian inspiration of the waterfront apartment of Portofino doesn't make it Italian. It's now globally owned. In, um, in London, when the, when the squares, the famous squares of London in the, in the West End were built in the early 18th century, they were private garden squares. Mm. And the, the squares were actually guarded. Um, and only the residents were allowed in, the residents and their guests were allowed in. And then there was a series of riots in the uh, late 18th and early 19th century. And it was decided that it would be better to privatize them, to, to, excuse me, to nationalize them effectively, yeah. to, to, to municipalize them. So that the, the house, obviously the property remained private, but the squares were opened up. Is there a chance that in your model of a, of a, of a private city, the ownership might change or that, that, or that things might change? There's a, is there any fluidity built into it? Oh well, yes, of course. Right. Uh, you know, the, like the squares, courtyards is a very ancient Indian design of living. Right. And uh, while today it is planned, I do not believe that we'll have much control over it after 10, 15 years. Right. When creative destruction begins, it is going to change enormously. Right. Uh, I may not be around to see it, but it'll happen. Okay. Okay. Can I make a remark about technology? Absolutely, and so on? Yeah. absolutely. Because uh, I think the question you asked, does it, uh, does it have an influence, does it change? Obviously, yes. I mean, that sure. is a no-brainer, yeah. yeah. obviously. But, um, but that's, it's kind of superficial, though. I mean, it's, it speeds things up. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the fundamental is that underlying all this, and the, the reason for cities is to enhance interaction and bring people together. Cities are a manifestation of people and their interactions. It's mm -hmm. not the roads and the buildings and the internet. It's the manifestation of human interaction. And human interaction is universal. Right. So it turns out that every single person in this room and every single person on this planet, on the average, can only have a very powerful interaction, I will call it love, yeah. with about four to six people. That's all. Four to you can six, only love four to, four to six people. You can really have a powerful, that may change in your life. You may have 500 six. best friends on Facebook and God knows how many emails to deal with, but the real powerful interaction is that, and that is hardwired in and it does not change yeah. and will not change. And that's why, in fact, cities are the way they are, it turns out, because of that minimal number of interactions. Mm -hmm and the way the hierarchy builds up in terms of those interactions. That is a kind of invariant, and it's the reason why you have this extraordinary <coughs> regularity of cities. How can it be that cities in Chile, Colombia, Australia, China. Japan, United Kingdom, United States, all behave in the same way when they've not influenced each other in, yeah. over the, you know, the centuries? Well, it's because their cities are, believe it or not, people and the modality of their interaction, namely whether it's talking or telephones or whether it's now internet, et cetera, et cetera, simply changes the speed of, what you do, of how those interactions take place, but not the organization of those. And that's why your city will eventually evolve to lie on one of those curves that I showed. Yes. Because of all. Because it's people live in them and people will make the changes. So you may work extraordinarily hard at changing Vancouver and you will and you will better life. But in fact, you only have to work with 10 or 15% because the other 80 to 90% is already taken care of because you are a city and because in that city are Canadians who are people like people all over the world interacting in the same way. So technology plays a, in a certain sense a superficial role of speeding things up and allowing greater interaction. Right. Well, I, I would agree that, uh, I mean, cities are, uh, there, there is a solidity or static nature for most of what happens. We look at that with our city budgets, for example. Most of it is fixed, essentially. We're not going to change it through uh, political decisions. Um, basically, there's a, there's a trim tab, if you will, that uh, and t technology, I, I, I would assume, is like that. It has the opportunity to hopefully 
steer us uh, on a more uh, sustainable course. I think it, kind of connecting back to your sense that we don't actually understand cities as an ecosystem. The, the, the science of cities is not really as well developed as it maybe it is for the natural world, but cities are part of the natural world. And we are, we are uh, degrading ecosystems to feed our cities. In Vancouver, we, we have, uh, I think, four Earths worth of uh, ecological footprint that we are consuming as a city. And one of our goals is to get down to one, one Earth footprint which uh, with energy use and water and resources that we're going through uh, is going to require a, a pretty effective trim tab. And hopefully technology can help that, but I think it's, it's also got to go deep into the, the way that we live uh, because we, these cities are, are uh, consuming an enormous amount of our, our resources right now, and that won't be sustainable over the long term. Now, there, there, um, there was something in your talk which I either didn't understand or misinterpreted, or maybe I got right, but was that the, um, the metabolic rate decreases in animals as they get bigger. And yet in cities, it doesn't. Um, it, that seems to be one of the anom anomalies right. in your theory, that in, in cities, people walk faster and they right. get faster. Is that right? Yes, you said it exactly right. With, in, in, the, in biological life, organisms, uh, uh, roughly speaking, uh, there's a continuous economy of scale. The bigger you are, the less you need per capita. Yeah. Everything slows down the bigger you are. Heart rates get slower. And when you grow, you grow quickly and stop. Mm -hmm. And that's why life has been around for several billion years. Cities, the thing that we have invented by coming together and going to what you said at the beginning, why we have cities, yeah. we also learned that working together for the same amount of energy, we can produce more. And so this is crucial. This was something that doesn't exist in biology. And that's what we call superlinear behavior. Instead of economy of scale, the less per capita, you find in, in cities you have this phenomenon of more per capita. And it turns out um, <laughs> is that it's the mathematics of social networks as distinct from the mathematics of metabolic networks in mm -hmm. biology that distinguishes these two. And it begins because in biology, capillaries, for example, or the, the endpoints are very, not very important. I mean, there's millions of them and so on. Yeah. They're not. But in, in social life, the individual is the dominant thing. The thing at the end of the network dominates, and the hierarchy decreases as you go up. And it turns out that inversion from biology leads to increasing capita, increasing returns per capita, and to open-ended growth. Which, which can only be sustained if you can, going again to what was said earlier, if you have continuous innovations yes. at a faster and faster rate. Mm -hmm. This is the, this is the catch, mm -hmm. is that you have to innovate faster and faster in order to have open-ended growth, meaning you have to have this continuous change. And this is a huge challenge for us. Mm. What, what so, are, Finn, what are the implications yeah, yeah. of that? Yeah, no, exactly. no, so, you know, we agree, thanks. <laughs> no, but I think that acceleration, and, and, and so collaboration was one of the themes for this uh, conference also, and to share best practices. And that is something, and I always say, do it live is the best. And then over drink, yeah. uh, dinner, lunch, <laughs> the, the coffee. Um, but we have to start embracing, and to, to, to cope with the challenges of building 100 cities of a million people, and we, we have to look sure. beyond yeah, our yeah. horizon. So, and so this is always, for me, at best. That's why I'm at these type of conferences. And, but then at the virtual world is second best, but we have to embrace it, and because we have to accelerate. Yeah. And if we start sharing, and like Ajit said, so and the look of Portofino is not you know, exclusive for Italy. It, it, it's going yeah. to be global. Yeah. And what can we learn from each other? How can we collaborate and take the best practices and by that accelerate that constant innovation, mm. and because we have to create three billion jobs. When I was studying, and, and I was already using out-of-date textbooks naturally when I was studying, but the, 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 the preoccupation was the megacity. You know, I guess there were textbooks probably from the 60s and 70s, and everything was about the megacity. This is going to be the future. And still, in a way, the, 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 a lot of the debate is around the megacities. But actually, the fastest growing cities are not those, are they? They're the, they're the middle tier cities, or the, even the third tier cities in China or India. 
Well, well I think that's right. But the thing that's amazing about cities is that, um, you know, bigger cities are better. The bigger right. you are, the, on the average, the better. This is an amazing thing, even to the extent that the carbon footprint per capita yes, yes. is lower. Yeah. Everything is better. You mm. save on infrastructure, mm. and everybody, despite, and someone said it, the slums and the mm, favelas yeah. and things, but they're part of the process. Yes. So I would, I would like to, maybe this sounds a bit self-serving, but I'd like to put a big plug in for the idea that we do need desperately to develop a science of cities or to ask the question, is there one? Mm -hmm. You know, is there a science of cities? Because, you know, you can build, you know, the Wright brothers could build an airplane knowing nothing about aerodynamics and hydrodynamics and materials and so on. Mm -hmm. But you try building a Boeing 747 without understanding the science, it's hopeless. So really to come to terms with building new cities, retrofitting older ones, we really urgently need to understand what, is the organ what are the organization principles, what are the underlying dynamics, but is the implication so of that then, if, if, if really we, we acknowledge that we don't understand the science of cities fully yet, is the implication that we don't embark on building new megacities, but we retrofit and expand existing ones where we know that the, the existing structures work, they do function? I, I think we yeah, have to yeah. do both. And mm -hmm. if I go back to my home country, the Netherlands, yeah. Is it the country or is it now a mega city? A city, yeah. Uh, it's yeah. Seven, yeah. Seven, city. Yes. Yes. 17 Absolutely. million people. You know, I don't think in Rotterdam and Amsterdam and Eindhoven. Yeah, I think in you know one airport, yeah. one big harbor. Yes. And so also from a governance yes. point of view, it's going to be one of the sessions. Uh, that, that, you know, do we have the governance yeah. methodologies in place yeah. to think different and to think at a much different scale? Big cities are good things. I, I think yeah. that, that that's more or less Not, the agreement. Yeah. But and that there is a, a big opportunity to, to merge, and we still have to build also yeah. new ones. When we began the concept of Lavasa, it was far away from Pune City. Mm -hmm. Now, the expand, Pune City has expanded mm -hmm. so much so that the, the outermost limit of Pune City are about 20 minutes from Lavasa. Oh, right. 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 Our fear is how to keep Pune out of Lavasa. <laughs> <laughs> but, that's, that, that, but it's going to add yeah. to each other. It, it, had, it has some enormous potential for doing that. So there is. A, and in the end, you know, we, we, we worry over, have sleepless nights that we might build the best infrastructure. It would be a very planned place across the socioeconomic spectrum. All that is fine. But in the end, without the art centers, without the yeah. cafes, yeah. without the naughty nightclubs, and without the gay parades, mm -hmm. there is no city. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that's without, exactly uh, right. Those were the final that tests. That is what a city is. Yes. That is what yes. a city yes. is. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. It's that and, and then the, the biological underpinnings, because some big cities in the world are, are not sustainable at all, and they need to be retrofitted. They, they have enormous exactly. carbon footprints. Yeah. Uh, many people say New York City is one of the most, the greenest cities in the world because of its density and it energy yeah. use, but uh, uh, you know, it depends. If you're powering a city on coal versus uh, hydroelectric, which we are in Vancouver, yeah. our, our carbon footprint is very small, like a number of Scandinavian cities. Yeah. Uh, we focused on, on producing uh, more, uh, more ecologically sensitive power, but we're going to have to retrofit cities and the new cities, the, the three billion uh, population that will settle in cities, they, they can't, we can't do that under the same model that we've built an array of different cities and different energy sources and ways of treating our waste. I think we, we have to have the most evolved and the most intelligent and technologically savvy approach that respects all of the resources and, uh, and the life-giving resources in particular. So that uh, if we repeat what we've built to date, uh, I, I think it's, it's unlikely we'll be able to continue to innovate and drive, uh, drive things upward. And is there, is there a point at which we have to say for the world, these are designated city zones and we have to leave something to grow stuff? We have to leave, so, these are designated city zones that we acknowledge that places like the Netherlands will just become one big city, possibly the whole of Northern Europe just becomes one big city. But yeah. that we need, we need a little reserve of agriculture as well at some point. So do we need, how, do we, how do we regulate the growth of cities? Do we? Vancouver has, has actually uh, benefited from protecting the agricultural land in our region going back into the uh, early 70s. So mm -hmm. it's been almost 40 years of protecting agricultural land because uh, in Canada and, and particularly in the West Coast, we don't have a lot of uh, rich agricultural land. 
very different from, uh, from other parts of the world. So it's, it has been a great benefit to have local food production maintained. That said, mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's restricted the, the, the footprint of the city and the, the value of real estate is sky high. So it, it has uh, unintended consequences as well as we try and concentrate on a small piece of real estate. Right. Right, because yeah. the Netherlands yeah. is really but, but at the same time, fun, you'll still want to eat strawberries from Australia in winter. <laughs> you know, there's, uh, we've, we've examined the UK data, and actually there's a lot of evidence that uh, the UK is actually one city, effectively. Yeah. Well, effectively <laughs> operates as one city. Yeah. That yeah. Uh, it's all London. Yeah. You know, that the, every, it's extraordinary, actually, in terms of the data. But, yeah. but you know, I think yeah. so. Yeah. How much do we know? You know, we have a lot of perceptions in our heads, but in a lot of cases, that we don't talk factually. A couple of data points. Uh, the, the, the GDP of New York and as a city mm -hmm. at this moment is around a trillion. It's the same GDP as entire India. India. Yes. And, it, and you know, we are often driven by perceptions and ideas that are not factual. And so an, an, an urban science type of project with best practices and perhaps four or five models will emerge, yeah. or six, I don't know, but yeah. not a hundred. Mm. And, and, and that is, but then we have to start planning the globe. And yeah. <laughs> I don't know, or that's yeah. realistic. But you know, even that trillion one. of all India, 80% of that is from the cities. Oh, yes, that's true yeah. everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I think it's 90-something yeah. 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 percent. Yeah. 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 It's 90-something percent. Okay. Well, I think that's a stimulating point to end on, stimulating, optimistic point to end on if we're talking about cities. So thank you so much, panelists. Thank you for uh, listening, and I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.